Hello and welcome to the second of our SEMA P3 Performance Strategy Lectures. This lecture regards risk management. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to have to do to manage risk is to have a strategy. How is this strategy going to be determined? Well, the first thing we've got to look at is the risk appetite within the firm. This will be determined by the attitude to risk of the various people within the firm. There may be pressure on those people to make sales, which increases the risk-taking attitude. The nature of the business may determine the amount of risk taken. The background of the board will also determine whether they're risk-takers or not, and whether that flows throughout the firm. And the pace of the industry, it may be that if you're in a fast-moving industry, you simply have to take risks to keep up. And the reputation of the firm, if it has a reputation for risk-taking, it'll attract risk-takers. Okay, the risk appetite also depends on the capacity for risk, and this is simply how much risk can the firm bear. You can't take risks that the firm simply can't cover. Okay, the elements of a risk strategy. Well, the first thing you've got to have is an organised statement, an organisation statement on their attitude to risk. You then got to assess the organisation's risk appetite. You then got to know what the objectives of your strategy are. You've got to determine is there a risk culture throughout the firm. You've got to ensure that there is management responsibility for the risks. You've got to have systems in place to assess and control the risks. And you've got to have performance criteria on which to assess whether your strategy is performing or not. OK, the SEMA risk management cycle is on page 15 of your notes. I'm going to run through the different aspects of it. The first thing you want to do is identify your risk. You may undertake a brainstorming session. You may get external advisors in to help. You may question internal audit. You may also question the rest of your staff, hand out questionnaires and see what they think the risks this firm are facing are. You may undertake a pest analysis, political, economic, social and technological. Or you may undertake a SWOT analysis, strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So once you've identified your risks, you're then going to measure your risks. You may use expected values, and that's the probability of the event times the expected amount should that happen. Okay, so the prob is the probability of the event. X is the value if that event occurs. And we have an example in the notes. Okay, volatility. This is how much do your returns fluctuate around an average? So the calculation involves firstly calculating your expected value. Your expected value less your lowest potential result is your upside volatility. Your expected value less your highest potential result is your downside volatility. And again, in the lecture, we did an example of that, which is in your notes. Value at risk really is a method for moving the standard deviation of your portfolio it determines the maximum loss that you're going to have in a period, for example, one day. Banks will use this when they have a portfolio of investments. OK, this brings us on to risk mapping, and we'll use a, an impact and consequences matrix. We'll map the risks on this depending on whether they're likely to happen, and the consequences if they do happen, being high and low in each category. Once we've mapped the risk, we then need to respond to the risk. The four things we can do, we can transfer the risk. We can avoid the risk, not take it at all. We can reduce the risk through some sort of insurance. Or we can accept the risk. The way to remember this is Tara. OK, so how do we control risk? Well, we may choose to diversify. If you diversify into an uncorrelated business, it means that if your core business activities take a hit because the other business is uncorrelated, it shouldn't go down at the same time. The way to do this may be to integrate. Backwards integration will be down backwards through your supply chain into the raw materials. Forward integration may be through distri distribution channels and moving your goods yourself. Or horizontal integration may be into complementary goods or potentially taking over a competitor. Does integration work well? 
for excellence you're supposed to stick to the knitting, i.e. stick to what you're good at. So diversifying into uncorrelated businesses, you may find that you're simply not able to take it on. If you move into a related industry, it's more than likely that that's going to be correlated, so it defeats the purpose of diversification. And under a lot of the theories we have, investors are already diversified. They hold various stocks which should give them a diversification that you don't need to provide to them. So, any other ways to reduce risk? Well, you can have strong internal controls and that should reduce the risks. You can hedge the risk, which we'll look at later in the, in the course. Or you can share the risk. You can take someone on with you who's going to accept some of that risk. On then to risk reporting. A risk report has a few aspects. Number one, you're going to report the gross risk, which is the risk really before any controls are in place. If you just let the risk run, this is what it would be. The residual risk, however, is the risk once you've put a control in place. It's what's left once you have the control in place. So you must have a reporting system in place. It's going to follow the risk management cycle that we looked at and on page 15 on your notes. It's going to be reviewed annually and it's got to have a cost-benefit analysis. There's no point in putting risk management processes in place if it outweighs the cost of the risk in the first place. So what are the responsibilities throughout the firm for risks? Firstly, we're going to have a risk management committee. They're going to be responsible for various things. Number one, the risk awareness throughout the firm. Secondly, the risk management policies. Thirdly, the processes in order to control the risks. And lastly, they're going to report to the board. How are they going to do these things? First of all, they're going to determine the risk profile or appetite of the firm, which we've already talked about. They're going to review and monitor the policies. They're going to communicate throughout the organisation. Remember, through enterprise risk management, you've got to communicate the risks so that everyone's aware of them. They're going to seek specialist advice if there's risks that they maybe don't understand or don't have the expertise to look at and they're going to undertake training and implementation programs to make sure that everyone is aware of what they're supposed to be doing. You're also going to have a risk manager. They're going to be responsible for leading the risk management team. They're going to undertake the risk mapping exercise and they're going to implement the strategies. They're also going to monitor the strategies and maybe improve them if there's things that they see on the ground that can help to improve them. They're going to be responsible for the risk awareness program. They're going to work with the committee and the board. They don't just go off and work independently. They report to the committee and the board to make sure that what they're doing is correct. They make sure that all compliance with any regulations occurs. They'll work with the insurers to make sure that any losses are communicated quickly and effectively. And they'll assure external audit. What that means is that they will provide assurance to external audit that risk management programs are in place and that risks are adequately controlled. Okay, so that's a quick run through of risk management.